Well, good morning and uh, welcome to Trinity Sunday. Uh, it is uh, the first time that I've been brave enough to have a crack at preaching a sermon on the Trinity. Uh, uh, if you're following the readings, you'll notice I got the reading wrong because last time, uh, many, many years ago, when I did uh, the, the three-week Sunday that we've done, Ascension, Pentecost and Trinity, uh, I did Ascension and I did Pentecost, but then I did something completely different on Trinity Sunday. I was too afraid to give it a go. So uh, I'm giving it a go today. So we'll see how we do. And of course, uh, the nature of, the, the, of what we're going to do today uh, is a little bit different to what we might normally do where we have the, the passage in front of us and we, and we mine that for what it's telling us. We're going to take a more syst uh, a systematic approach today. That is, we're going to sort of try and do some systematic theology, which is where we're trying to pull together some ideas from the scriptures and, and, and kind of put them together in a way that kind of makes sense in a logical uh, order and is true to the world. Word of God, um, and uh, we're going to do that in the hope that it gives us greater clarity and insight into who God is, and therefore into how we should be. So whilst it might sound like I'm about to dive into a theological lecture, and it may sound like that at times, and I, but I hope it's an interesting one, uh, there will be something in it for us as well as to how we need to think about living life uh, in community together. So, as I said, we're trying to take the biblical revelation of God and try and understand who God is and how it is that he reveals himself to us. And what we see when the scriptures reveal to us God is at the very start, there's, there's a little hint at the complexity of God. We, we're taking this three-week break from our uh, wider series that we're doing on the book of Genesis and you might remember when we were looking at Genesis chapter 1 uh, a few weeks ago, back when God creates uh, humanity, he says this. Then God said, that Genesis 1.26, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. From the very beginning, we get uh, singularity and plurality. We get God said, let us. And the human beings he creates, male and female, uh, are, are, are of the one kind, human beings made in God's image, but there's diversity within that, isn't there? Male and female. And in Genesis 2, of course, we read about how Adam uh, is, needs someone like him to partner with him to, to, to rule over the world and under God. As God's image bearers, we're made for community. And of course, I think that's in part because part of what it is to bear the image of God is to bear the imprint of of the community of the Godhead. One God led us. That is, we see it at the very beginning that God is one and more than one, although we don't get much more insight into that at the very beginning. But what we do get a lot of insight into, especially throughout the unfolding story in the Old Testament, is while God might say, let us make mankind in our image, he is not many gods, uh, uh, he is one God. So when we get to places like Deuteronomy, we hear these words, Deuteronomy 6, 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Uh, and that is repeated time and time again. It's very clear uh, that we worship one God. In Isaiah 43.10, you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me, no God was formed, nor will there be one after me. There's just me, I'm it, one God over all. So we've got this hint of complexity or community within God in the Old Testament, but of course that becomes even uh, but we but, but we very much major on his uh, his uniqueness, his oneness. But the, that that hint of complexity becomes more clear in the New Testament. God reveals Himself to us in the person and work of Jesus, and we see 
uh, throughout uh, the New Testament, God revealed, uh, or, or, or three different people uh, or persons uh, revealed uh, as having God like character. So there's the Father, obviously. Jesus says in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And when Jesus is teaching the disciples how to pray, he says, in, when he teaches them the Lord's Prayer, you're to pray to our Father in heaven, Matthew 6, verse 9. And the Father and the Son, we read, are intimately connected in the work that they do. So in John 5, verses 9 to 20, Jesus says this, very truly I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees his father doing, because whatever the father does, the son also does. For the father loves the son and shows him all he does. Yes, and he will show him even greater, greater works than these, so that you will be amazed. So we've got the father, but very closely connected to the father, we've got the son. And the father speaks about the son uh, in, Matthew, uh, in, uh, in places like Matthew 3, 17, when, uh, he's get, when Jesus gets baptised. The father speaks from heaven and says, this is my son with whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And the son plays a vital role, doesn't he? Because what we see is that the, the, the son has to return to the father in order to send the spirit, who's the third character who uh, is revealed to us in the unfolding story of scripture. So in Luke 24, verse 49, Jesus says, I'm going to send you what my father has promised. So the father's promised it, but the son will send it. And what's that that he's sending? It's the Holy Spirit. Stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. Or in John 15, 26, as we heard last week on Pentecost, when the advocate, that is the spirit comes, whom I will send to you from the father, that's Jesus who's sending it, the spirit of truth who goes out from the father, he will testify about me. So we've got father, son and spirit all working together. And as the New Testament tells the story of Jesus and as it tells the story of the early church and as we read the letters that the apostles are writing to the early church to help them to walk uh, under uh, the lordship of Christ and in perfect uh, worship of the father in heaven uh, through the power of the spirit we see that time and time again father son and spirit are all possessing the necessary attributes of God they're all working together to bring about the kingdom of God the Bible speaks about Father, Son and Spirit as separate and distinct, but also as connected and one. So places, let me just run you through a few places, like Hebrews 1 verses 1 to 3. In the past, God spoke through our ancestors, spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things and through whom he also made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. That is some pretty high praise and a high view of the son, isn't it? And as Jesus, connect, uh, as Jesus uh, ascends into heaven, he connects his ministry and the ministry that he wants his disciples to do as part of the church as a work that is to be done uh, with the Father, Son and Spirit. So Matthew 28, 18 and 20, Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them not in the name of God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is uh, Jesus speaking to a bunch of Jewish disciples, telling them to baptise people in the name of Father, Son, and Spirit, and expecting them not to... not not expecting this to cause them trouble, being good monotheistic Jews waiting for the Jewish Messiah, whom they know Jesus to be. Paul talks about Father, Son and Spirit working together in the life of the believer in his letters, Galatians 4 verses 4 and 6. When the time set had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. 
Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, the spirit who calls out Abba, Father. God, the Father, sends the son to save us and the spirit helps us to know the Father as our Father. Or in 1 Corinthians 12, verses 4 to 6, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Spirit giving different gifts, serving gifts under the serving and using our gifts under the under under the same Lord and working out our salvation and our role under God, who's at work through all of this. Ephesians 4 verses 4 to 6. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. I'm pretty sure at least one of the takeaways from that that Paul wants us to have is that there's one. He says it a few times, doesn't he? One church, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. And yet in saying one all the time, he's also saying spirit and Lord and God and Father. So why kind of take you on that very quick uh, and uh, brief uh, skirt through uh, Old and New Testaments? Because one of the things you might hear people say is that the, the Trinity is not a biblical doctrine. It's not an idea that the Bible supports. And they'll say this because they'll say, you can't quote uh, a scripture verse that says the word Trinity. Now, I'll let you in a little uh, tip here, a favourite game that I like to play, uh, is that when you are trying to uh, convince someone that something's in the, uh, in the Bible that's not, what you can always quote from Hezekiah. Uh, you just say, it's, no, it's in Hezekiah 5 verse 15. It says, I am God and I am the Trinity. It's a very biblical idea. And then people walk away confused because it sounds like you've said something from the Bible. But of course, uh, th there's no such book. Um, so there you go. Uh, you can, you can uh, tr tap that one away for uh, uh, testing out uh, whether or not people will believe what you're saying. And it's also a good idea why you should check what I'm saying uh, with the Bible in front of you when I'm preaching. Make sure I'm not quoting from that crazy book of Hezekiah. But that's the argument, right? People say, it doesn't say, I am God and I am a trinity. But I think what I uh, have attempted to show you and what I can show you in more detail if you're still not convinced is that, in fact, it's a very biblical idea that, in fact, we can't make sense of what the Bible teaches us about, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and go into all the world and make disciples, baptise in them in the name of Father, Son and Holy Spirit. We can't hold these ideas together in the Bible that God has revealed himself to us in unless we hold to the idea of the Trinity. That is, God reveals himself to us as one God, Father, Son and Spirit. And the name that we've given that as we've systematised this is the Trinity. So that begs the question, well, what is it exactly? How am I supposed to understand it? Uh, and what does that, that actually mean for, for life? And I want to say it's important that we understand the Trinity as best we can. Because we want to try and understand God correctly because we want to know God. Just like you want to spend time getting to know your friends. You, you, you don't want to just make a series of assumptions or go, oh, they're a bit complex. Who cares? I can't really be bothered getting to know them. That's not the way we treat people whom we want to know. And God has revealed himself to us, one God, three persons. And so it's useful and respectful and right that we spend some time getting to know him. So where did this word and, uh, come from and how has it developed over time to, to systematise the, the words of scripture into a coherent doctrine? Well, the word Trinity was first used by a guy called Tertullian in the second century. And of course, this is another uh, 
piece of evidence that our friends who like to, uh, who would rather it, we quote from Hezekiah like to use, they say, uh, well, it took them 200 years to use the word Trinity, so it's clearly not a biblical idea. But of course, whilst it might have taken uh, 200 years for the word Trinity to get uh, used in a piece of Christian text, of course, it's used in, a con in the context of discussing the Bible. It's used as Tertullian's trying to explain how God has revealed himself to us, one God, threefold name, Father, Son and Spirit. And he's trying to unpack how this works. And of course, as you might expect, what basically happened was that the, the church kind of was going along, making disciples of Jesus, figuring out how to live, uh, trying to deal with persecution, uh, doing the things that Jesus told them to do. And, and it wasn't really until it was growing a bit and things were developing a bit and people started saying some things that were kind of crazy that the church actually had to get serious about going, hang on, we need to actually spend some serious time putting some boundaries around what it actually means for God to be one God, Father, Son, and spirit. It's actually the development of heresies in the early church, that is wrong beliefs about God, that caused the church to go, we need to do some serious work at kind of putting some boundaries around what it is to understand God as Trinity. Uh, and so uh, what we see in church history is people saying, some very wrong things about the nature of God. And uh, let me just bring to your attention a couple of these uh, uh, heretical men. There was a guy called Sibelius. I've probably said that wrong, but uh, you know, one of those words that you read all the time but uh, never say out loud. And uh, he was an interesting guy because he proposed that whilst God is Father, Son and Spirit, he, he is not, uh, though, he's only ever one of those things at one time. And, and, and this became known as the heresy of Sibelianism. And there's a few other people who chipped into this heresy. Uh, and it's now kind of part of a more, uh, a, a wider heresy that's called modalism. Uh, so there's a guy called Marcion who, who, who kind of has similar views that get caught up in this. Uh, uh, but what's important to know is not their names or who they are, but what they believed, which is that Father, Son and Spirit are different modes of how the one God operates. And he only ever takes one mode at one time. So I think the best way to get your head around this is to understand the modern day version. And uh, I think... Uh, they should rename modalism as uh, the H2O heresy because that's effectively what it is. You might have heard the Trinity explained as, H2, as, as being like a molecule of H2O before. Uh, that is, so I'm assuming you all know what H2O is, right? It's water in science. Um, and uh, people say God is like H2O. He can be gas, steam. He can be liquid, water. And he can be solid, ice. But this is modalism, right? Because H2O can only ever be gas and it can only ever be water and it can only ever be ice and it can only be one of those things at one time. You never have a piece of H2O, if that's the right, a molecule, that's the word, of H2O, uh, unless you have... Uh, it, it can only ever be one of those, in one of those three states. Uh, and in fact, there's a whole movement out there today called Oneness Pentecostalism. And you might have even seen uh, books by a guy called T.D. Jakes. This is what they believe, that God operates in these different modes, but, he's, but they're only different modes, not one God, three persons. There's another guy called Arius who also gets... Uh, things a bit muddled up too, and he he's he's going the other. He he wants to defend the oneness of God, and so he says, "Well, 
Jesus is, was, wasn't originally part of God, he was created, and then he kind of gets joined into God later. Uh, and of course, the problem with that is then that completely undermines God's eternal nature and identity. So we don't want to go down that path either. So, but these are common views that are held at the time within the church and they're big arguments that are happening in those early years. And so it's not too dissimilar, I think, to what's happening in the church today. We, we don't have to have big arguments now, thanks to those who've gone before us, about how to understand God as the Trinity, but we're having debates in the church now about how to understand human flourishing and human sexuality. That, that, that's a big current debate in the church that's arisen because people are starting to get it wrong. And so in much the similar way that happens to it today, uh, the church had to get together and figure stuff out. And so in the year 325, they, they get together uh, in a town called Nicaea uh, at the Council of Nicaea and they try and figure out how you, they are to properly understand the Trinity. One God, three persons. And they spend lots of time debating, arguing, meditating on the scriptures and trying to work it out. And what they figure out is that the Father and the Son are of the same substance. And a few years later in 381, there's a bit more debate for another, what's that, 50 years uh, about the Holy Spirit. And they come back in 381, this time into Constantinople, and they figure out how the Spirit relates to all of this. And they make a couple of minor edits uh, to the Nicene Creed, which is what is produced after these councils that sets out how you're to sort of understand the Trinity. Uh, so, uh, I was going to get us to say the Nicene Creed right now, but I, I won't for the sake of time, and also because I've got something special saved up for later uh, that you're going to enjoy, I think. Um, but uh, I will put up, if we can put up that, uh, yes, this picture. Uh, basically, w what the creeds do is they... they they create a, 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 what I would describe as a tension matrix uh, for your brain uh, through which you are to understand the Trinity. So the, the, the doctrine of the Trinity can be summarised in seven statements. There is only one God, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is not the Father, which is nicely described in that picture there and basically that uh, that's that yeah, if you hold that intention you stay within the bounds of orthodoxy of right thinking about who god is well that's all very nice but why does any of this matter at all i, I think there's two reasons Oh, well, there's many reasons, but there's two reasons I want to talk about, about why this matters for us today. The first is, it matters for how we do relationship. Because we worship a God who is at constant and perfect relationship within himself, Father, Son and Spirit, and who has been eternally for all time. And so when John says this in his first letter, 1 John 4, 7, 8, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. God is love because God really is love. It's not like God is love uh, in some sort of abstract way. No, he really is love. He embodies love in himself because he is one God, three persons, Father, Son and Spirit, who are in perfect loving relationship with one another. And out of that love, God creates. And therefore, as a Christian community, we are to be shaped by God's eternal loving nature 
God created the world and he created you and me and put us in it, not so that he would be loved, but out of an overflow of his love. It's like uh, this... Uh, so much love within God himself that it just uh, has to go somewhere and, it, and it, it, it spills out into creation. It's all part, uh, it's all an expression of his perfect love. And so he calls us into loving community so that we will love like he loves. When he empowers us for love, he's empowering us for perfect love love that he is father son and spirit so it matters that we know that our god is a god of real love so that it can motivate us for love and so that we can ask god to help us to love as he is love i want to say i think it also matters for our culture see we live in a world that is uh sort of pulling apart at the edges a bit, isn't it, at the moment? It's, it's, it's going in two directions, I think. On the one hand, you've got uh, a, a, a part of the world that's obsessed with diversity and equality and inclusion. And, of course, the odd thing about that is it seems the more obsessed with those things we become, the less of it we get. And the reaction to those things seems to be a push towards monoculturalism. There's sort of like everything's falling apart and we're becoming too weird and diverse. And so uh, people push back the other way and say, no, we need to go back to monocultural life and be one. It's like a push. It's a bit more than three, but let's just, you know, loosely use the analogy. There's a push to three and then there's a push back to one. But I think what's happening actually is our culture's kind of right at both ends but completely wrong because it doesn't have the trinity and the tension matrix to hold all of this together. Because what you have is actually a good desire for unity or oneness and a good desire for diversity or threeness. But without God... you'll never get what you're looking for. You'll never get perfect unity. You'll never get the wonderful joys of diversity without God. Because in God, we have perfect unity, perfect equality, perfect inclusion, perfect diversity. Kevin DeYoung says this, If God exists in three distinct persons who all share the same essence, then it is possible to hope that God's creation may exhibit stunning variety and individuality while still holding together in a genuine oneness. I want to suggest that if we can think about God rightly, if we can understand who he's revealed himself to be, one God, three persons then by his empowering presence in our lives, we can model communities of unified love and diversity. And this will be terribly dissatisfying to the ideologues on either end. But it will be deeply attractive to those who are trapped in constant culture wars. And it will be deeply attractive because it's a community modelled on unity and diversity which expresses itself in perfect love in the Godhead which is what we're meant to express as our our cultural expression of who God is. How do you finish? Where do you land a sermon on the Trinity, right? I want to land it with uh, uh, telling you a story of someone called Athanasius. And Athanasius was a, 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 he ended up being an Egyptian bishop and prior to becoming a bishop, he was heavily involved in the writing of the Nicene Creed. Uh, and he was a strong defender of the Trinitarian understanding of God that we hold to be true today. He's a hero, if you like, of Trinitarian theology. And for his troubles, 
our good friend Bishop Athanasius was exiled five times because he just continued to hold fast to the fact that it was really important that you held that tension matrix in your head and you didn't get it wrong in any particular direction. Now, there's a creed that he may have written or that's been named after him that it's been tradition for the church to say on Trinity Sunday. Now, I don't, has anyone ever said the Athanasian Creed out loud in church before? Yes, four people. Four people know what's about to hit them. Uh, I thought this would be fun. So, uh, can I have a volunteer or two to pass out some... I was going to put this on the screens, but it's about 650 words, so um, it was a bit long. So I'm going to pass some of these out. And I thought uh, we could finish by saying the Athanasian creed it's a bit weird because we don't say things like this very much anymore uh, but it's it's cool uh, it's a, a focused uh, this is what someone says of the Athanasian creed let me read it to you a focused exposition of the trinity as well as a clear summary of decisions from previous ecumenical councils this helps us hold that tension matrix in our brain and it helps us to understand where we might go wrong with the Trinity and how we might get it right. So, let's uh, say together this epic creed. <laughs>